Welcome students to the Assam Tribune analysis video. My name is Manas and today we will discuss the Assam Tribune of 3rd August 2020. Also, we have included certain important news articles from 2nd August, that is last Sunday. So students, let us begin. So uh, these are a few uh, initiatives from our civil services achievers point. We have our regular offline classes. We have online live classes. We have certain free initiatives like the daily Assam Tribune analysis video, the weekly important MCQ discussion video. Also, we have answer writing skill development program for mains perspective. We have mock interview sessions for uh, the Assam Financial Services, also for the combined competitive examination conducted by the APSC. We are shortly coming up with optional classes, ethics classes and CSET classes. As students, you will be knowing that the CSET paper is compulsory now with qualifying marks in APSC prelims. So it is very important that you focus on CSET from now only. So these are the topics which we have picked today for our uh, video today. Also, we have an important editorial discussion. So the first topic which we are discussing today is the Chinese and Indian scholars join event on Baal philosophy and music. This topic will come under general studies one paper, heritage and culture. So the news is Several Chinese and Indian scholars have taken part in a cultural event organized by the Indian Embassy in Beijing to showcase the essence and universalism of Baal music and philosophy. Now, what is Baal music, music and philosophy? The Baals are dubbed as mystic saints living in rural Bangladesh and West Bengal and also uh, some areas of Tripura and our uh, Barak Valley in Assam. Uh, this Baal uh, music and philosophy has been included in the UNESCO list of intangible cultural heritage. The bowls are the bards of time while their ballads means their songs transcend caste, creed and religion to amalgamate mixed elements of Tantra, Sufism, Vaishnavism and Buddhism. These bowl saints log hote hain, ye log, uh, different uh, caste, different religion ko intermix karke unke uh, ek elements ko lake ek composite or ek cosmopolitan uh, ek element dete hai like the bowels of the West Bengal and the Bangladesh they take the Sufism concepts also the Vaishnavism, Vaishnavism concepts also and then they form an amalgamation or a mixture of the elements of those uh, religious sects famous bowl icon Lalon Fakir is said to have inspired Asia's first Nobel laureate, Rabindranath Tagore. So we have to know about who was uh, Lalon Fakir. Lalon Fakir was also known as Fakir Lalon Shah, Lalon Shah or Lalon Fakir or Mahatma Lalon, who was in a who was a prominent Bengali philosopher, author, Baal saint, mystic songwriter, social reformer, and thinker in British India. He lived from 1774 till 1890. Lalon is regarded as an icon of Bengali culture. He inspired and influenced many poets, social and religious thinkers, including Rabindranath Tagore, Kazi Nazrul Islam, and Allen Ginsberg, although he rejected all distinctions of caste and creed. So Lalon is a very uh, popular uh, personality and an icon of Bengali culture. So before we move on to the next topic, uh, this, uh, the topic which we covered here can be asked on two aspects. One is from our general studies, one culture aspect. However, as we, we have seen that recently China's influence in neighboring countries has increased and China has started uh, various uh, programs with our neighboring countries regarding cultural element also. As you will see, this Baal philosophy and uh, music event was organized by China in Beijing. So this may also, these points may also be added in our general studies to 
international relations topic so students i would request you to keep a note of it in under the indo bangladesh relations in general studies to international relations topic the next topic which we will discuss is government widens ambit of msme credit guarantee scheme the background is the government widened the scope of the 3 lakh crore msme credit guarantee scheme by doubling the upper ceiling of loans outstanding to rupees 50 crore and including individual loans given to professionals like doctors lawyers and chartered accountants certain for business purposes under its ambit so this topic will come under our general studies 3 paper topic economic development the this tweaking or this modification of the emergency credit line guarantee scheme was done based on demand from trade bodies and in line with new msme definition approved by the union cabinet in june we know that to tackle the uh, covid 19 situation our finance ministry had initiated an eclgs scheme that is the emergency credit line guarantee scheme to help the economy pass through this turbulent times and also uh, as uh, students must be aware that the msme definition was changed recently so we will discuss what is the eclgs is and what is the new definition of msme so here we can see uh, on the right side of your screen there is a government of india approved the new, revised definition of msme so as per the new definition of msmes announced in may the investment limit has been revised upwards and an additional criterion of turnover introduced also the distinction between manufacturing and services has been done away with so as you can see under the revised msme classification the classification has been arranged under three category micro small and medium for micro we have the investment is uh, the criteria is less than investment for investment it is less than 1 crore and turnover less than 5 crore for small it is investment 10 less than 10 crore and turnover less than 50 crore for medium investment less than 20 crore and turnover less than 100 crore so i would request uh, the aspirants to make a note of it because uh, an easy question can be formed here by the apsc regarding this uh, change in msme because the any change in msme is very important from our uh, economy syllabus as we know that uh, msme forms the crux or the core of our indian economy and many livelihood and many revenue uh, generation depends on M msme so whenever any topic regarding msme is in the news i would request students to follow it thoroughly and make a note of it so that in the examination it can be reproduced so here we will also discuss the emergency credit line guarantee scheme eclgs for msmes and mudra borrowers what are the key features under the emergency credit line guarantee scheme which was approved by the union cabinet so as you can see the under the scheme 100 percent guarantee coverage to be provided by national credit guarantee trustee company limited for additional funding of up to rupees 3 lakh crore to eligible msmes and interested mudra borrowers so we know that what this uh, ncgtc will do they will uh, additionally fund up up to rupees 3 lakh crore so that msmes and mudra uh, banks can have that money and that credit can be passed on to the uh, ssis and uh, small scale industries and msmes because the credit has to be moved uh, has to be circulated in the economy the credit will be provided in the form of a guaranteed emergency credit line facility as you can see it is said that guaranteed and it is emergency credit line see whenever government launches any program or any scheme the very idea of the scheme is very often uh, included in this name of the scheme itself so as you can see it is said guaranteed emergency credit line so this is a emergency provision for the indian economy the scheme would be applicable to all loans sanctioned under GECL facility that is the guaranteed emergency credit line facility during the period from the date of its announcement of the scheme to 30 October 2020. Tenure of the loan under scheme shall be four years 
with a moratorium period of one year on the principal amount. No guarantee fee shall be charged by NCGCT from the member lending institutions, that is the MLIs, under the scheme. And the interest rates under the scheme shall be kept at 9.25 percent for banks and financial institutions and 14 percent for non-banking financial companies. So I would request every uh, aspirant to make a note of this detailed features of the emergency credit line guarantee scheme. What are the benefits of the scheme? The scheme aims to mitigate the distress caused by the COVID-19 and the consequent lockdown which has severely impacted manufacturing and other activities in the MSME sector. The scheme is expected to provide credit to the sector at a low cost, thereby enabling MSMEs to meet their operational liabilities and re restart their businesses. So it will help the uh, to help the business persons to restart their businesses after the COVID-19 lockdown is opened. By supporting MSMEs to continue functioning during the current unprecedented situation, the scheme is also expected to have a positive impact on the economy and support its revival. So a question may come in mains in next year mains uh, that what were the what are the schemes and policies which are taken by the government in india so in that uh, question this uh, provision has to be mentioned by the students so i would request students to make a note of this scheme and the key features and the benefits coming to the next topic Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, AIIB, is in talks with India for financing project. This topic will come under General Studies 3, Economic Development. The Asian in Infrastructure Investment Bank is in discussion with the Indian government for financing a 8 billion US dollar scheme for improving health infrastructure at the district level to make the country better prepared for the future healthcare challenges. So, uh, in this topic, uh, first we have to know that AI, AIB, uh, where it is based. So, it is mentioned here the Beijing based multilateral funding agency had earlier approved a financial assistance of 1.2 billion US dollar for India to fight the COVID 19 pandemic. The government of India has discussed about its ambitious scheme of strengthening the health infrastructure. It entails building health infrastructure in every district, including upgrading of testing uh, facilities with the Indian Council of Medical Research, it is the ICMR. AIIB Vice President DJ Pandyan has said, it is a $8 billion project, he said, adding that the World Bank and Asian Development Bank are also involved in the discussion with the health Department of the Government of India. So here aspirants, I would like to make uh, a note about the difference between the AIIB, the World Bank and the Asian Development Bank. So APSC may ask a question giving a chart of these three uh, banks and uh, the headquarters where they are located and they may ask to match the following. So when we study the AIIB, we also have to study the World Bank and the Asian Development Bank. The finance ministry is trying to put up a financing plan for this ambitious scheme and the minute details are being worked out, he said. If things work out, the financing by the uh, Asian Infrastructure, sorry, the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank can be cleared this year itself on a fast track basis. With regard to COVID-19 assistance, Pandian said the bank has approved two loans of $500 million and $750 million respectively. The first loan of $500 million sanctioned in May was towards building a resilient health system that can effectively treat COVID-19 patients and prevent its spread. The $750 million loan was approved in June to help the government strengthen its battle against the adverse impact of COVID-19 on poor and vulnerable households. For AIIB, India is the largest borrower which accounts for 25% of the total lending by it so far. So this is a very important point. I request students to make a note of it. As of July 16, 
2020, the bank has approved up to 19.6 billion US dollar for 87 projects in 24 economies. Since its inception in 2016, the bank has approved loans to the tune of 4.3 billion dollar across 17 projects in India. India is a founding member of the multilateral funding agency with the second highest voting share. So this is another important and crucial point. I request students to make a note of it because a point may come in prelims to choose which of the correct options, which of the uh, options are correct. So there, these small, small details will help us. Currently, India has 7.6% vote share in their bank. It is the AIIB, while China holds a whooping uh, majority 26.63% stake in the organization that was set up in 2016. Now coming to the next topic, Gadkari has okay's scheme to make India self-reliant. The topic comes under General Studies 3, Economic Development. MSME Minister Nitin Gadkari has approved an employment generation program proposed by Khadi and Village Industries Commission to make India self-reliant in Agarbatti production. The program named Khadi Agarbatti Atmanirbhar Mission aims at creating employment for unemployed and migrant workers in different parts of the country while increasing domestic uh, Agarbatti production sustainable, substantially. So what this program will do, the Khadi Agarbatti Atmanirbhar Mission, it will create employment for the unemployed and the migrant workers. As we know, because of the uh, COVID-19 lockdown, there has been a migrant uh, issue and there has been, uh, they have been rendered jobless as they have moved from their place of work. So this scheme, this uh, uh, program will help them uh, to have a employment and livelihood at the same time, it will increase the domestic agarbati production substantially. The proposal was submitted to the Ministry of MSME for approval last month. The pilot project will be launched soon and on full-fledged implementation of the project, thousands of jobs will be created in the agarbati industry. The program aims at hand-holding artisans and supporting the local agarbati industry. The current consumption of agarbati in the country is, is approximately 1490 metric ton per day but local production is just 760 metric ton as you know in india in many temples and mosques and the dargahs uh, the agarbattis are frequently used so the consumption is very high however the, the demand is very high however the local supply is very less there is a huge gap between the demand and the supply and hence immense scope for job creation is there. Under the scheme, the Khadi village, uh, the Khadi and Village Industries Commission, that is the KVIC, will provide automatic agarbatti making machines and powder mixing machines to the artisans through the successful private agarbatti manufacturers who will, an agree, who will have an agreement as business partners. Now it is decided to procure only locally made machines by the Indian manufacturers. The center earlier took two major decisions by placing the Agarbatti item from free trade to restricted trade in the import policy and enhancing the import duty from 10% to 25% on round bamboo sticks used for manufacturing, to, uh, manufacturing of Agarbatti for the benefit of the domestic industry. So two major decisions have been taken. First is placing the agarbatti item from free trade to restricted trade in the import policy and enhancing the import duty means the import tax is uh, increased from 10% to 25% so that import is decreased and our local production is uh, appreciated local production increases and the supply is from our locally manufactured agarbattis <coughs> The two decisions of the central government created a huge employment opportunity in the Agarbatti industry. In order to encase the huge employment generation opportunity, a design program, namely Khadi Agarbatti Atmanirbhar Mission, has been submitted to the Ministry of MSME for approval. So, if any uh, question comes regarding the steps the government has taken 
uh, the steps taken to improve the economy after the COVID-19 lockdown. So this Hadi Agarbati uh, Atmanivar mission will can also be included. So I request students to make a note of it and revise them properly so that they can be reproduced in the actual exam. Coming to the next topic, Niti Ayok suggests creation of dark bank. This topic will come under general studies three economic development. Now the background is in a bid to further deepen financial inclusion in the country. The Niti Ayog has suggested the creation of a dark bank. that is the postal bank by merging the regional rural banks among other recommendations to the government. The Niti Ayog has suggested the over 1.5 lakh post offices in the country should be made outlets for a proposed dark bank. Also, the think tank has suggested easier norms for granting bank licenses. So the Niti Ayog has suggested that the uh, regional rural banks should be merged and also the various post offices in the country should be made outlets for a proposed dark bank because we know that the Indian post has reached uh, nearly all the corners of Indian uh, territory. So if the post offices can be made outlets for a proposed dark bank, then it will be ensured or it will be making it easier to help in the financial inclusion in the country. In another major recommendation, it has suggested privatization of three banks, the Punjab and Sindh Bank, the Yoko Bank, and the Bank of Maharashtra. So this comes under the government's this investment policy that has go, that, that, that the government has initiated and the government is already considering bringing the banking and insurance sector under its ambit. The likelihood of the government going for privatization of public sector banks has all, but has also drawn criticism and protests from bank workers unions. In the banking space, with the latest merger of bank, uh, public sector banks coming into effect in April, India currently has 12 public sector banks down from 27 in 2017. As you know, RBI uh, has uh, repeatedly uh, emphasized that India public sector banks can be minimized. So various committee recommendations suggest that. So government has initiated the disinvestment policy and the privatization of the public sector banks. During the announcement of the Atmanirbhar Bharat economic package in May, Finance Minister Nirmala Sitharaman has said that the center will come up with a new public sector enterprise policy and open up all the sectors to the private sector. So this is another point which maybe uh, students should make a note of it so that in the economy uh, section questions it may be added. Now coming to the next topic, Bagzan blowout has harmed Gangetic Dolphins, World Institute of India report. Wildlife, sorry, Wildlife Institute of India report. Now this topic will come under the general studies three, biodiversity and environment. The Wildlife Institute of India has reported that the Bagzan well blowout has harmed the uh, harmed and endangered the Gangetic dolphins and the impact of the uncontrolled oil and gas emissions will have a long-term impact due to contamination of groundwater. Now we know the Gangetic dolphins are very endangered, are endangered, and the Bagzan well blowout has hampered them. The Wildlife Institute of India has called for an assessment of the cumulative impact of the gas wells. The Union Ministry of Environment, Forest, and Climate Change has sent the report, uh, the findings, to the Assam government to begin restoration work. In its report to the center, the report said that a Dolphin was found dead from poisoning from the oil spill. The location of the blowout near Dibru Saikoa National Park, the Maguri Motapung wetlands are home to endangered hollow gibbons and Gangetic dolphins. Now, this line is very important because from this, many questions may come, multiple questions may come in APSC prelims or even in UPSC prelims also. First, we have to know uh, where the Maguri Motapung wetlands are located. Uh, I request the aspirants to go through our uh, 
uh, MCQs also because in MCQs we have covered this topic, this question very uh, well. Also, you can the aspirants can go through our weekly weekly MCQ videos uh, that will also help them from the prelims perspective. Uh, so the location of the Maguri Motapung wetlands are home to endangered hollow gibbons and Gangetic dolphins. Now this. Hollow gibbons and Gangetic dolphins are very uh, important from our syllabus point of view because the hollow gibbons are the only ape found in India and Gangetic dolphins are the national aquatic animal of India. So uh, we will look after these two uh, wildlife in the, in the next slides. The report also said that oil wells in and around the national park will be detrimental to the region's unique ecosystem and that it also uh, extremely vulnerable to earthquakes. So the report has also uh, said that the, that the oil wells around the national park will be very uh, detrimental or it will have a negative impact on the region's unique ecosystem and also it is extremely vulnerable to earthquakes. As we all know that Assam is in a very vulnerable position to earthquakes. Now coming to the Ganges river dolphin, the Ganges river dolphin is the national aquatic animal of India. It is one of the national symbols of India. Gangetic dolphins are found in the river systems of Ganga, Brahmaputra, Meghna and Karnafuli Sangu in Nepal, India and Bangladesh. The Ganges river dolphins, the scientific name is Platanista and Platanista gangetica. So students should make a note of the scientific name also because it may be added in some of the options in a MCQ. So the Ganges River Dolphins were officially discovered in 1801. The original stretches where the National Aquatic Animal of India are found are the Ganges Brahmaputra Meghna River Systems and the Karnafuli Sangu River Systems of Nepal and Bangladesh and India. The official animal of the Indian city of Guwahati is Ganges River Dolphin. This is an extremely important point. Students should make a note of it. The IUCN status of the Gangetic Dolphin is endangered. It is classified under Schedule 1 Wildlife Protection Act 1972 providing the absolute protection as offenses under these are prescribed the highest penalties. So these points should also be noted by aspirants because uh, APSC may ask a question regarding these points. Now coming to the Holok Kibon, the Holok Kibon is the only ape found in India. The primate is native to Eastern Bangladesh, Northeast India and Southwest China. The Holok Kibon is categorized into two types. Western Holok Kibon, it in inhibits in all the states of the Northeast, restricted between the south of the Brahmaputra River and east of the Dibang River. And outside India, it is found in Eastern Bangladesh and Northwest Myanmar. <coughs> It is listed as endangered under the International Union for Conservation of Nature, IUCN Red List. So these points are important. APSC may sure shot given MCQ based on these points as the options. Now the another type is Eastern Holok Gibbon. It inhabits specific pockets of Arunachal Pradesh and Assam in India and in Southern China and Northeast Myanmar outside India. It is listed as vulnerable under the IUCN Red List in India, both the species, that is the Western Hollow Gibbon and Eastern Hollow Gibbon, are <coughs> sorry, are listed on Schedule One of the Indian Wildlife Protection Act of 1972. So the Ministry's Export Appraisal Committee had recommended environmental clearance for drilling and testing of hydrocarbons at seven locations under the national park. The report mentioned that. Given the potential of oil blowout and oil spill disaster like this, such oil wells in the vicinity, in the neighborhood of Debru Saikwa National Park and important bird area complex will be detrimental to the conservation value of this unique system. The report also said richness in bird species was found to increase with an increase in distance from the site, possibly due to the oil spill and intense noise from the blowout. The report says that the bird species richness is lesser near the uh, site of the oil wells and the blowout area. However, as the distance increases, the bird species richness also increases. 
this shows that the that the oil spill had a negative impact on the wildlife population the decline in bird species was highest in grasslands 59% and wetlands 85% compared to areas located away from the site the report said fish species have also declined in wetlands and river tributaries where dissolved oxygen levels have fallen due to the oil spill the concentration of toxic polyaromatic hydrocarbons in fish samples from the wetlands was found to be 10 to 100 folds higher than normal so we can see that this report suggests various detrimental effects which the oil blood had on the ecosystem of the uh, area around the dibru saikwa national park so if any question comes regarding this topic uh, i ask i request the students to make a note of these points because these points are from an official ministry report so it can be quoted in the examination so before quoting mention the ministry from which you are reporting the uh, you are quoting the report okay so moving to the next point the report also said that there has been a massive decrease in the gangetic dolphin presence in the lohit dibru and the maguri motapung wetland after the blow out because we know that the gangetic dolphin resides only in clean or clearer water so if the gangetic dolphin uh, presence is decreased then it's a clear indication that the uh, the water uh, wetlands and the water bodies have been uh, contaminated the report also added that the loud noise the loud noise due to the blow out can be heard as far as from 12 km and beyond making the area extremely unhealthy for humans animals and birds so here we have discussed the salient points which the report has mentioned and if any question comes regarding this topic in the exam students can quote this report now coming to the uh, editorial discussion here we are discussing an important dis uh, editorial let tigers thrive this topic will come under the general studies tree paper biodiversity and environment in a welcome development the tiger population in the northeast <coughs> has continued with its rising trend with an estimated population of around 219 tigers as per the all india tiger estimation report of 2018-19 released by the prime minister recently however the nameri and pakke block has shown a decreasing trend according to the report assam has emerged as a, as the state with the seventh highest tiger population in the country with a count of 190 now Uh, it is a good news that assam is placed seventh in the uh, in the uh, tiger population ranking however it also creates a concern because as we know since independence assam has faced uh, repeated uh, balkanization that is the process of uh, creation of other states from assam so due to that uh, assam has shrinked the area the geographical territory of assam has shrinked substantially so any increase in wildlife uh, population or tiger population uh, will create a challenge for the government of assam and the forest department to maintain them in a uh, proper natural habitat so we will look into this issue further the author discusses this issue in the editorial the report also mentions problems of encroachment within the kajiranga national park besides unabated coal mining in other forest areas that also harboring the big cat encouragingly the tiger presence was recorded from the newly formed kamlang tiger reserve and namdafa tiger reserve the latter having drawn a disturbing blank some years back so these two tiger uh, tiger reserves should be uh, noted down also the other tiger reserves which assam has should be made a note of by the students the healthy big cat population in assam is largely sustained by high prey biomass in the brahmaputra flood plains and the kajiranga population has remained one single large source tiger population in the landscape the tiger the kajiranga tiger population was traditionally connected to the orang tiger reserve on the west and the nameri and pakke tiger reserve in the north through the island systems of the brahmaputra however there is a concern because the growing human settlements in the uh, island systems of the brahmaputra and the anthropogenic anthropogenic pressures have eroded much of this contiguity today similarly the kajiranga karbianglong landscape the kajiranga karbianglong corridor 
has also been robbed of their continuity in the face of encroachment and industrial and commercial activities. Now, these industrial and commercial and human activities can spell doom for long-term survival of the big cat in the region. And the state government must accord some top priority on maintaining the link among different tiger habits. The connectivity to Karbiyanglong is also crucial for dispersal of tigers and other wildlife that use these hills as a natural refuge during the floods. As we know, the highlands of the Karbiyanglong area are used by the tigers and the other wildlife animals during the floods. So any uh, human activity which breaks the connectivity link will seriously impact the wildlife population. While India now has nearly 70% of the global tiger population, concerns and challenges remain, especially for long-term conservation of this apex animal. Once rampant, poaching of the tiger has now been brought, uh, brought down to reasonable levels following the global outcry over the rapidly dwindling, dwindling tiger population a decade back. So the poaching has been uh, brought down to uh, reasonable level, uh, levels. Also, our tiger population has been increasing to a good level. However, the shrinkage of tiger habitat is still a major concern. Since the tiger sits at the apex of the, uh, of the food chain in Asian jungles, its well-being is intrinsically linked to the health of the entire ecosystem in forests. So, as the tiger population is increasing, the poaching uh, levels are decreasing. So now the challenge is to have a very healthy ecosystem in the forests so that the tigers and other wild animals can have a natural habitat. For saving the tiger, not only poaching has to be curbed with zero tolerance approach, but equal stress has to be given on preserving tiger habitats because the long-term goals of tiger conservation cannot be met without securing their habitat. So in this editorial, many important points have been made. So I would request students to make a note of it. And if any question comes on mains regarding this topic, the students may reproduce these points after they revise them periodically. So uh, this is the last uh, editorial. Further, the editorial discusses tiger bearing forests have already undergone serious fragmentation due to deforestation and degradation and it is impossible to sustain viable tiger populations in small and fragmented habitats. So we need large habitats and interconnectedness in the habitats like from Kajiranga to Orang or to Nameri, from Kajiranga to the Karbianglong highlands. These uh, linkages are very important. It is only through a multi-pronged strategy involving a sustained crackdown on the thriving poaching network and preservation and restoration of tiger habitat that we can hope to rescue the tiger population. So, uh, experience with this, we come to end uh, to our editorial discussions. Uh, many important points from prelims perspective and mains perspective have been made in this video. So, I hope students have listened to them very carefully and made a note of them. Uh, I request the students to revise these uh, notes periodically so that they can be reproduced in the examination. So before ending, these are the final, uh, uh, these are the uh, various courses available at Civil Services Achievers Point. Uh, I hope students have uh, learned a lot from this video. So until the next video, keep revising, keep uh, reading and uh, all the best. Thank you.